Good afternoon and welcome to NASA's Wallops Flight Facility in Virginia for our pre-launch news conference for Northrop Grumman's 11th Commercial Resupply Services mission to the International Space Station. The launch of the Cygnus spacecraft, filled with about 7,600 pounds of research, crew supplies, and hardware, is scheduled for tomorrow, Wednesday, April 17th, during a five-minute launch window that opens at 4.46 p.m. Eastern. Cygnus will launch on an Antares rocket from Pad 0A from Virginia Space, Space's Mid-Atlantic Regional Spaceport. I'm Stephanie Shearholtz of NASA's Office of Communications, and I'm pleased to have with us this afternoon Joel Montabano, Deputy Manager of the International Space Station Program, uh, Frank DeMauro, Vice President and General Manager, Space Systems at Northrop Grumman, Kurt Eberly, Antares Vice President, Northrop Grumman, Doug Voss, Deputy Chief of the Range and Mission Management Office at Wallops Flight Facility, and Pete Hasbrook, the manager of the International Space Station Program Science Office. We'll begin with opening comments from our presenters, and then we'll be happy to take your questions. For those following online, you can send us questions using the hashtag AskNASA. Joel? All right, well, good afternoon again. I'm gonna start with a video with our current crew on orbit, and so let's see if we can roll the video, please. And lift off. So we had a spectacular off, launch uh, early this year in March, where we brought uh, three astronauts and cosmonauts back to the inter to the International Coast Space Station, the increasing our crew complement to six. You can see NASA pretty excited. This the is the, the welcome of the crew. Uh, takes just six hours from launch to docking to the International Space Station with this launch. You know we've been doing a lot of research and science on board the International Space Station. You heard some of it earlier today. You'll see a couple pictures, and I'll talk a little bit about it. Um, this picture right here is uh, David from the Canadian Space Agency doing some work on combustion. You know, the, the work that we can learn on doing how things burn in space allows us to be more efficient with our engines and our rockets and, and allows us to load less fuel into the satellites as we launch them into space, allows our rockets to, to operate more efficiently. And you know, the goal is to deliver the satellite, the goal is not to deliver fuel. And so what we can learn on the International Space Station and have that directly apply to our satellite infrastructure is just a huge benefit to people here on Earth. You see some other experiments here. The, uh, the NICER experiment, which is a high precision measurement of neutron stars. Um, in fact, some of this research that was recently recognized by the Nature magazine and published, it was published in work we did on board the International Space Station that research it, your researchers on the ground have used to better understand the universe. Uh, going further, you see another experiment here. This is a Canadian experiment where our astronauts wear goggles and in microgravity, they measure the motion and they measure you know, how accurate, how the, the crew members deal with, um, with depth. And, and what they can use that information for is you can use it for the elderly population on Earth. You can use it for some of the different diseases we have on Earth. So the goal is to collect this information on board the International Space Station and again, directly applying to people here on Earth. Um, if we're going to leave low Earth orbit and go to Mars, we're going to have to grow our food on orbit, and we're going to have to eat it. And so there's a picture of uh, David, you know, using what we grew on orbit and then uh, eating his little snack. That was some uh, wasabi, um, wasabi lettuce, I believe, that he was eating. So we're doing research on board the International Space Station. We're doing research with all five, you know, partner agencies. So not only NASA, it's the Japanese Aerospace Exploration Agency, the Canadian Space Agency, the European Space Agency, and you know, the Russian Space Agency. We work together, we combine what we learn on Earth, or on orbit, and we bring that back on Earth. So now going specifically to why we're here today with the Cygnus spacecraft and the launch of Antares for tomorrow. Uh, Stephanie said the launch of, uh, at uh, 1646 local, uh, once Centaurus delivers a Cygnus vehicle on orbit, well, they'll start its rendezvous to the International Space Station. We're planning the capture of the vehicle at uh, 5.30 Eastern time on Friday, followed by hatch opening about 1 p.m. Friday. 7,600 pounds, 
uh, will be delivered with this vehicle, and that's a combination of utilization and research hardware. It's a combination of vehicle hardware. We have crew supplies. All this hardware is being brought up by this vehicle. And the unique thing from this vehicle here is we now have the ability for a late load. We have the ability to load uh, hardware on board the vehicle at launch minus 24, 24 hours, which we're doing today. And we're taking advantage of this new capability of the Cygnus spacecraft, and we're gonna be flying 40 mice. I think you heard that earlier today. And you know the goal of the International Space Station program is to do what we can to enhance and increase the science and utilization and the research we can do on orbit. This new capability that was added by the Northrop Grumman team is a step in that direction. And it not only allows us to fly the rodents, we also have, it allows us to fly different science and it'll be a capability that we not only have for this mission, but future missions on the Cygnus spacecraft. So we're excited to be here. And so with that, I wanna thank the, the Wallops Flight Facility, the Northrop Grumman team, the, the Mid-Atlantic Regional Space Board and everyone involved in getting the spacecraft to where we are today. Uh, I promise if you uh, deliver us a good spacecraft, bring it to the International Space Station, we'll take good care of it. I'll hand it over to Frank. All right, thanks, Joel. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, very excited to be back here at Wallops for another mission. This will be our eighth uh, flight of Cygnus on our Antares launch vehicle. Uh, and just reminding things, something you, you probably already know, but this is the 314th anniversary of Isaac Newton being knighted by Queen Anne. Uh, and this is the 152nd birthday of Wilbur Wright. So two very special people in the, uh, in the science community. Uh, we'd also like to thank our, uh, the team here at Wallops, uh, at NASA, our partners at NASA Johnson Space Center, as well as here at Wallops Island, um, of course, Virginia Space, uh, and of course, our partners on the Antares team for making this, uh, making this day possible. Uh, looking forward to a, uh, a successful launch tomorrow. So why don't we uh, cue the video and I'll just give a little bit of an update of uh, what the spacecraft has been going through and preps for its mission. So here's the service module arriving from our Dulles, Virginia facility where it's assembled and tested. Uh, we, we take the vehicle out of its transport container, doing some, we do some tests. Uh, while that's going on, we also unpack the pressurized cargo module which arrives directly from our partner Talisalina Space in Italy. Uh, those modules are mated to uh, create the Cygnus vehicle. In past uh, missions, we've actually loaded cargo before this point in time, uh, but with the, the new uh, cargo operations that we do now with the late load, we actually um, load the cargo later. After we complete making a Cygnus, we bring it to the V55 facility to fuel it, and we install the NanoRex external uh, CubeSat deployer. After that, we move the vehicle over to the horizontal integration facility where it's loaded with its initial cargo, and then it's mated to uh, the Antares rocket, as you can see here uh, going on in the, in the video. At this point, the car we have about 2,500 kilograms of cargo uh, on the spacecraft. Uh, once it's mated, uh, we will actually then perform another cargo load that we call late load, uh, which is another 600 kilograms, about 1,400 pounds of cargo. We'll go into the, uh, the cargo module. And then once that's completed, we'll do a closeout of the vehicle, making sure the air inside is clean, and then we will close the hatch uh, and seal that for the mission. Uh, once that's completed, then the Antares team takes over, and uh, we will start encapsulating the spacecraft inside the launch vehicle fairing. Uh, once that's complete, the, the uh, launch vehicle with uh, Cygnus on out to the pad. Eventually, we'll be doing the uh, final load on the pad, as Joel talked about. Uh, after we lift off the uh, tomorrow afternoon, about 10 minutes later, we'll separate the spacecraft from the launch vehicle and we'll start our journey up to the International Space Station, uh, raising our orbit and phasing with the, uh, with the uh, station. Along the way, we'll deploy the solar rays, which are built by our Goleta facility uh, in California. Uh, after we do that, we'll check out the spacecraft, make sure it's healthy for its rendezvous. About a day and a half later, uh, Friday morning in this case, we will arrive just below the ISS, about 1,000 meters, and start making our way up towards the, uh, towards the station. Uh, once we get about 10 meters below the ISS, the crew will grapple the spacecraft with the uh, cannon arm, and then eventually, uh, once it's grappled, it will get maneuvered and attached to the space station and be fully berthed. 
Uh, once we're there, the, the crew will check out, make sure everything's in good shape, and then they'll eventually open the hatch, and Cygnus will be part of the space station. The crew will remove the cargo we've delivered and then load it with trash for disposal. Uh, on this mission, after we leave the ISS, after about three months there, uh, we'll actually raise the orbit above the ISS. We'll deliver our uh, CubeSats from our uh, external CubeSat deployer by NanoRacks, as well as our Slingshot deployer. It'll be our second mission for Slingshot and our seventh mission for NanoRacks. And after that mission is complete, we're going to start an extended duration mission for Cygnus where we're going to demonstrate uh, the ability of Cygnus to fly for long periods of time in space where it can be an excellent test bed for scientific experiments, where we can check out new technologies for deep space exploration. Um, and we'll also demonstrate the ability for Cygnus to uh, fly with two vehicles in space at the same time and offer that capability not only to NASA, but commercial industry and other government industries. So we're excited for that demonstration to happen after we perform the primary mission um, uh, of delivering the cargo. Um, and finally, uh, in keeping with tradition, Northrop Grumman names each Cygnus spacecraft in honor of someone who significantly contributed to the U.S. human spaceflight program. For NG-11, we dedicate this mission to Roger Chaffee, who was selected by NASA to what would have been the first manned mission of the Apollo program. Uh, tragically, Roger Chaffee and crewmates Gus Grissom and Ed White died in an accident during a launch simulation. Unlike his crewmates, Lieutenant Commander Chaffee had not yet traveled to space, and we're honored that our Cygnus spacecraft will represent Roger Chaffee's planned journey to space, reminding us all of those who made the ultimate sacrifice so that others could pursue their dreams of space exploration. Uh, one other thing I'd like to note, this is the, uh, the final mission of our CRS-1 contract. Uh, when I think back uh, when we first started this, looking ahead to what would be our last mission seemed like so long ago. Uh, but here we are, and I just want to thank the many, many people uh, at Northrop Grumman, at NASA, all around the country, and all around the world for making these, this program possible. And now we uh, look forward to completing this mission successfully and then moving on to our CRS-2 mission. So go Cygnus, go Antares. And with that, I'll turn it over to Kurt. All right. Thank you, Frank. On behalf of the Antares team, we are really excited to be back here at Wallops with our NASA and our Virginia space partners for another Antares launch. We had a, a very successful NG-10 launch this past uh, November 17th at 4 a.m. I'm sure many of you were here. Mm -hmm. It was an amazingly clear night, and thank you to all the amateur photographers up and down the East Coast who sent out some really amazing pictures and video of the vehicle all the way to orbit. So, and Joel, on behalf of the viewing public, after four straight night launches, uh, I would like to thank you and the ISS program <laughs> for arranging the orbit of the ISS to produce the wonderful uh, 4.46 p.m. launch time tomorrow. So we really appreciate that. I'm sure all of you uh, appreciate that as well. Uh, but seriously, I'd like to take this opportunity to thank the folks who enable us to do these launches. I'd like to recognize Dale Nash and his Virginia Space Team who operate and maintain Launch Pad Zero A that we launch off. They do an outstanding job, and we appreciate the excellent support from the Commonwealth of Virginia. I'd also like to thank Doug Voss uh, David, and David Pierce, who is the new facility director here at Wallops, and we welcome him. And we also like to thank Bill Robel, who was the prior director for his service and his strong support of our program over the past decade. We really appreciate the Wallops range team for the outstanding support we receive and the flexibility they, they give us. We also get great uh, support from the community in the area, hotels and restaurants, and uh, Appreciate everyone's uh, interest and enthusiasm for, for this program. So a big thank you to everyone. Uh, I'd like to roll a video that, that uh, highlights the Antares processing. All right, in this video, we highlight the outstanding Antares and Cygnus team members who have worked extremely hard over the past six months to put this mission together. It's truly an honor to be a part of this team and get, get to help lead such a professional and dedicated team. It's truly the team behind the system that makes a launch successful. We begin systems integration of our Antares vehicle in the horizontal integration facility, or the HIF, here at Wallops. We have the capability to integrate two vehicles at once, as you can see. Here we're showing the final phase of rocket integration, and after fueling, Cygnus is brought into the HIF, then rotated to horizontal to allow initial cargo loading to take place. And seen here is the first use of our rotating payload mate fixture, which allows cargo to be loaded in all orientations. For this mission, you have heard about our new late load capability. This is accomplished using our new pop-top fairing, which is built at our facility in Iuka, Mississippi. You can see the nose cone coming off there, and that's what we're going to use to access Cygnus and load the, the final cargo. So after we encapsulate Cygnus in the fairing, 
we will lift onto the transporter erector launcher that you see there, it's the strong back. We also use that as a, an umbilical mast and that rolls about a mile down the road to pad 0A. This is actual footage from this mission, NG-11, so we got some nice daytime footage. Uh, our photographers are very excited that uh, they actually had light uh, for their cameras. And here we rolled up the pad and there you can see our mobile clean room that we're going to use. It goes over the front of the fairing and that's where we remove the nose cone and enable access to Cygnus. These are pictures from our Pathfinder that we executed last summer to practice those operations. Here's an actual footage of, of NG-11 on the pad. Uh, we went vertical. We did some tests this morning. We're going to go back down this afternoon, uh, load up cargo uh, this evening. Then go back up horizontal overnight, and in the morning we'll lift off and fly Cygnus to orbit. Okay, on Monday we rolled out to the launch pad, connected to the pad, we rotated the vertical. This morning we completed a combined systems test. That verifies all connectivity between the Antares rocket, the Cygnus spacecraft, the launch pad, and the range. That's a really key test for us, that went well. We are now gonna rotate the vehicle back to horizontal in the next hour to prepare for final cargo load this evening. The Antari Cygnus team, the combined team will arrive on console at 11 a.m. tomorrow morning, and the five hour countdown will begin at 11.46. We have a five minute launch window that opens at 4.46 and we will target the opening of the launch window. I'm very excited to mention that we are partnering with Virginia Space and flying secondary payloads on this mission. We have loaded 60 ThinSats plus one NASA sponsored 3U CubeSat called SASE onto the, avion the Antares avionics section and 265 seconds after we separate Cygnus and they're on our way, uh, we will start separating these secondary payloads into orbit. The thin sats are small STEM satellites built by students from 70 schools located in nine states. Virginia, Arizona, North Carolina, South Carolina, West Virginia, Kentucky, Maryland, Florida, and Connecticut. So a really good footprint and a lot of involvement from across these states. After the thin sats are deployed, students will collect and analyze data transmitted from their satellite for approximately five days before it deorbits and burns up in the atmosphere. And SASE, the 3U CubeSat, is an aerothermal spectrometer spacecraft and was built by students from the universities of Indiana and Illinois. And we have, I understand we're gonna have 200, 250 of these students here to watch the launch, and so you can just imagine how excited they're gonna be to see the, their spacecraft get launched into orbit. All right, and now time for my public service announcement uh, about launch hazard area clearance. I'd like to say a word about public safety and airspace clearance. As you recall, on some past launches far into the past, we have had boats and airplanes travel into the restricted area and force us to scrub for the day. I'd like to encourage everyone who's coming to see the launch to please follow the directions of the Wallops Range personnel and the FAA, the state police, and other public agencies who are working to protect you and ensure the safety of the viewing public. We all want to see a good launch on the first attempt, and we appreciate everyone's co cooperation. And we particularly appreciate the extra work the Wallops Range has done to raise public awareness, particularly within the general aviation community. Thank you all for being here. We're looking forward to another good launch tomorrow. Doug? Thank you very much, Kurt. So uh, as Kurt said, uh, 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 the um, aviation community and boating community is a, a, group of, an or, a group of people that we keep in close touch with on the Wallops Range, and I appreciate that announcement and uh, that extra encouragement on, on, on that issue. So the Wallops Range is ready for NG-11, and uh, again, I want to echo the thanks and, and, and uh, welcome uh, Northrop Grumman, uh, NASA, um, the, um, uh, all of the uh, users of the Wallops Flight Facility on this mission, uh, on a mission that enables so much good, good work going on. I mean, we're re resupplying space station, uh, supporting science, supporting STEM outreach, so excellent to be a part of that. Um, we've been working for a number of missions on this. This is the ninth launch of Antares from Wallops, and we look forward to continued work on the next uh, CRS-2 contract as well. Um, and a first for this mission at Wallops Flight Facility uh, is the use of the Mission Operations Control Center. Um, and we have a couple photos on uh, showing that facility. The Mission Operations Control Center is a facility on the Wallops main base that um, will be supporting NG-11 in future missions like this. Um, this mission, or this facility, replaces a nearly 60-year-old launch control center on Wallops Island um, that was used, actually, for the uh, first space launch, or, or um, orbital space launch mission, the Scout, uh, back in the early 1960s. So uh, uh, we've, we've uh, provided uh, Antares and Northrop Grumman a, a great place to work. They've been working out of a facility that was built in, I think, 1960 or 61 for the last nine missions. So um, we look forward to providing this state-of-the-art facility 
It exercises state-of-the-art communications, processing display systems. Um, it has interfaces to all of our launch pads and uh, any launch vehicle that we uh, want to launch from Wallops Flight Facility, our range control center, and other critical systems and facilities. So uh, the team at Wallops on the facilities and the range and engineering side have built a uh, highly resilient facility that's state-of-the-art and it's going to hopefully carry us another 60 years um, uh, for ELV launches and other missions from Wallops. So uh, on to the weather, which is something that is a, a positive note for this mission, at least for the first couple of days. Uh, the, uh, at the LRR today, we had an updated weather briefing from our weather office at Wallops. And um, um, we have a slide to show there. But the probability of violation uh, for our primary launch day on the 17th looks very good. It's only 5%. Um, a little bit of concern about low cloud ceilings, but uh, it, it looks like we're, we're really good in terms of weather for this mission and um, all the factors that fold into that. As we roll into the second day, if we do, um, it, that probability violation goes up a little bit, but it's still pretty good at 20%. And um, going into, uh, if we have to go to the 19th on Friday, then uh, the probability violation goes up significantly. So I'm confident that uh, all systems and facilities are going to be go for this mission and hopefully uh, get it done on the first couple of days. Um, weather looks good for it. So really on, on behalf of the Goddard Space Flight Center, the, the Wallops Director and Wallops Flight Facility and the Wallops Range, again, I want to thank uh, Antares and Northrop Grumman and the Johnson Space Center for using Wallops Flight Facility. I want to thank you, the community, for being such a strong supporter of Wallops Flight Facility. Uh, we we uh, enjoy having you here to come watch our launches. And uh, thank you very much. Okay, on behalf of the science community, uh, I'd like to thank all of you for coming today. Uh, a lot of you were here in the previous briefing, so it's always great to see people coming back and showing interest. The Cygnus launch tomorrow is really important to us in the science community. Um, almost around half of the cargo that Cygnus is bringing is dedicated to science for us on the International Space Station. Most of that cargo has been pressurized in the past, but we're getting more and more unpressurized cargo on the Cygnus, which is really neat to see. But one of the most important things happening, actually right about now, is this late load. It's a, a great capability for us. In the science world, a lot of our science and our samples are life limited, whether they are living samples, they need a life support system, or whether they need to be temperature controlled, let's say for a physical sciences experiment, and if they don't have that temperature control, you lose the phenomenon that you're trying to study. So this late load capability is very important for us, and we really appreciate what Northrop Grumman has done. Um, popping the pop top of the fairing and in, inserting our biological cargoes. Uh, they've added a life support system within the Cygnus. It's actually an extra locker in there, so it's controlling oxygen and humidity and uh, carbon dioxide. There's also a data system that will downlink data so we can, on the ground, our control centers and our scientists can make sure that this, the data, the samples are really being taken well care of and they're all in good shape for the arrival at the station. The uh, station itself is a multidisciplinary lab in space. A lot of labs on the ground on the Earth will focus on one discipline of science, and a lot of them focus very narrowly on a subdiscipline. Station is multidisciplinary, it's diverse, it's leading edge. We're a, a cutting edge laboratory in space. We do the, the breadth of research that we do falls under biology, biotechnology, Earth and space science human research, physical sciences, technology and development and demonstration, and global education. Over the course of history, we've had something around 2,600, 2,600 different investigations performed and still ongoing on station. Normally, we could tell you over the course of six months roughly how many investigations we've got, but we're really getting good enough at our processing that we have things coming through the system and they will be assigned in the next couple of months and launched in the next couple of months. It's too early to say what those numbers are going to be. But typically, it's about 300 or so investigations going on at any one time. Cygnus is contributing to the success of at least 40 investigations. About 35-ish are already are being brought up by Cygnus, and another 5 to 10 or so are supporting investigations already ongoing on ISS. If you were with us, if you weren't with us earlier this afternoon, some of the scientists in the briefings that you missed. I'll give you some of the highlights that, from this mission. Uh, and these scientists and experts are still around here, so you can catch them after the briefing and ask some more questions of them. There's the Astro B facility, which is going to be three, about bread box size, 
autonomous free-flying robots that will fly in formation. It's testing technology. It also becomes a facility for other experiments to use them with the goal eventually of helping, helping offload the crew members from doing kind of some of the mundane tasks as well as free flight and giving the ground control team a little more insight into what's going on. Another experiment is space fibers where we are manufacturing ZBLAN network fibers on the station. You can do them on the ground, but in space and microgravity, they come out much more pure. And it's actually a, a really good potential commercial market. It's got high payback for the low launch and return mass, so we're excited about that. A bioanalyzer from the Canadian Space Agency will be able to analyze blood and other samples on board the station so we don't have to bring those samples back home. We've got a rodent research mission launching, which is studying the, the body's response to a tetanus and a vaccine, or a vaccine. That is one of the primary users of this late load capability. We're very appreciative of that. The Virginia Space ThinSat Consortium and the Satellite Consortium folks are here. And a couple of folks who didn't get to talk, but I know they're here, uh, Bionutrients, which is using, studying using algae to purify water as well as grow food for future use and the robotic external leak locator, which was managed out here at Goddard Space Flight Center. It was actually a previous technology demonstration used on ISS, and it worked so well that it's now become an established system. There's a lot of work, as I said, going on on station, and Joel mentioned the Soyuz crew that just arrived a little bit ago, brought us to six crew members total, brought us to four USOS or US operating segment crew members which is great for us in the research world because that fourth crew member essentially doubles the amount of crew time that we have to do all this science that's coming through the system. So we are doing pretty well keeping up with that demand, but if you're a scientist out there, please know that we've got opportunities for you. It's a great time to do your station or your science on station. Other things going on in the station program, uh, our program science office and our multilateral partnership, the International Partners, just finished a new document called the Benefits for Humanity third edition. This is the third in a series. The last one was about three or four years ago. It's a series of about 100, 130 stories about the research that we've done on station and how that benefits all of us on Earth. This being the third edition, we, we expanded the envelope a little bit and we explored the economic value of some of these experiments in space. There's a lot of investment that goes into the experiments and the research. How is that paying us back? And we took a couple of tacks on that. For example, the CubeSat market, which really was just invented 20 years ago, has started ramping up in the last 10 years. You can look at the market value of a company that's involved in that and say that business has been developed by the CubeSat market being deployed and developed from the International Space Station. Another area is looking at healthcare and pharmaceuticals. If you've got a drug or a technique that was developed using research on station and it's extending people's lives or reducing the amount of caregiving that they have, that feeds back into the economy as well. They can work longer, the caregivers can go back to regular kind of jobs. So it's a, the other new thing that we did in there is called, is the effect on the scientific community, the science value of the research that we're doing not just the individual results, but how is that playing around the world between and among science disciplines? For example, I like to think of biophysics. In biotechnology, we're trying to figure out down at the molecular level what's going on in these living, living organisms. If we want to analyze blood or a sample in space, now you're getting into small tubes. Who but the physicists who, who understand that flow and can help optimize that? So biophysics is an emergence in, in the science field. There are five other sections in the book. Uh, as I said, these stories are really easy to comprehend for those of us laymen on the ground. You can find more information at www.nasa.gov slash station benefits. And the other major thing going on in the science world, you all remember that we did a one-year mission uh, that concluded about three years ago now. Scott Kelly and Mikhail Kornienko spent 11 months on station. You probably know Scott has a twin brother named Mark. They were both astronauts, both are retired now. And it was a great coincidence and we made the best use of it. So we designed, our human research program designed a series of experiments to follow Scott and Mark through the course, not only of the time Scott was on station, but the six months prior, set a baseline for Scott and Mark, see, take a lot of data during that 11 months, see how Scott's data diverged, if at all, from Mark, and then follow him again for six or eight months after Scott got back. And there are really some 
unique and remarkable findings. We have to preface this by saying Scott is one subject, and so you can't draw a lot of conclusions about how Scott and Mark diverged. But some great things are most of the things that changed while Scott was in flight came back to within the pre-flight readings fairly soon within that six months after Scott returned. Um, another area that we're glad worked well is the immune response. Scott and both Mark and Scott got a vaccine about a year, a flu vaccine a year before he flew. Scott gave himself the flu shot in orbit. Mark did the same thing on the ground and then they each got him again after they landed. And the body's immune system for both of them reacted as we would expect and reacted as we want it to for that vaccine. And another great benefit of all this, of the, the suite of investigations, is just learning how to analyze the data. There was so much genetic analysis and comparing what changed from Scott's pre-flight to in-flight and what diverged from Mark that we now have an idea of what is affected by spaceflight and it helps us focus in future spaceflight studies what is going to change and what should we pay most attention to. You can find more about the TWINS study on www.nasa.gov slash twins study. You can find the paper there and you can find layman's summaries of all that science. So to wrap it up, we're very thankful for the Cygnus mission and all the support here. I'll finish it up with saying go Cygnus, go Antares, and go science. Thanks. Great, thank you for all those wonderful summaries, gentlemen. We will now take questions. We'll start here in the room, and uh, then we'll go to social media uh, for questions using the hashtag AskNASA, and then we'll uh, take any questions we get on the phone line. So please uh, wait for a microphone to come to you, announce your name and your organization and to whom you're directing your question. I see a question here. There's a couple in the room, so we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, Pat from, excuse me, Pat from rocketlaunch.live. For Cygnus, um, you all had demonstrated the ability to boost ISS's orbit. I think it was OA9. Um, is that planned to be done in this mission or future missions? If not, uh, yeah, not? so we're not planning it for this mission. That, the, uh, that was uh, the uh, OA9 mission. Uh, that did, uh, experiment, I think, went, went very well. Uh, hopefully we'll be able to demonstrate that in the future, but, uh, but this mission, we're, once we fly away, uh, then we'll, we're going to do the, the other extended duration uh, demonstration. Okay, great. There's a question back here. Hi, Chelsea, space.com. I'm curious about um, both visibility and audience. Uh, how many people do you expect to attend the launch? And then also to add to that, how, how visible do you think it will be in the nearby area, and where do you think that visibility will stretch? Sure, I, I, can, I can address part of that, at least, um, maybe all of it. So w we do expect record numbers at Wallops Flight Facility for this launch, uh, I think partly because of the, uh, the attention. I mean, the students that are participating in the mission, there's a couple hundred of those, and faculty members associated with these small sets, but also the time of day makes it you know, easier to get up. <laughs> So uh, that, that's certainly something, and so we do expect to see record crowds, and um, again, that's why uh, Kurt and others uh, recommend everybody be safe and don't go anywhere you're not supposed to. Um, in, in terms of the, um, uh, how far you can see it, uh, the Wallops website publishes uh, plots in a Google Earth type map format where you can see the, with visibility uh, plots put on them, so you can see it, but I know out in central Virginia, I talk to people regularly that hundreds of miles away can see it, people in New York City, so, um, those are on uh, uh, Wallop's web, web page. And nasa.gov slash Northrop Grumman. We have a visibility viewing map there as well. We have a question up, up in front. Ken? Hi, thank you. Um, thank you very much, Space Explosives, for I think Frank and uh, Kurt and all of you, congratulations. Good luck, first of all. Can you talk a little bit more about the, sp uh, the late load? How long will that take operationally wise to, to lower it? to load the cargo, and then to raise and confirm that everything's okay with the rocket. And I'd also like to ask about the Cygnus. It's gonna be extended duration. You're gonna be, besides the CubeSats, you're gonna be running any experiments down to three months and then during the even longer period beyond that. Thanks. Uh, sure, yeah, so, so uh, we'll be uh, lowering the vehicle here shortly. We will take the nose cap off, and I think we've allocated seven hours for the, for the what we call the final load. Um, 
there's initial, late, and final. So the final is the one we're going to do at the pad. Uh, we've got seven hours uh, allocated in the schedule for the Cygnus and Antares team to, uh, to uh, do that load. Uh, Cygnus will then close the hatch. Antares will then put the nose cap back on and maneuver the clean room out of the way. And uh, I think that time's out around uh, early morning, 6, 7 a.m. We'll be going back, uh, back uh, vertical at that point and get ready for the, the countdown start, which I mentioned was 11.46 uh, a.m. Yeah. There's, I'm sorry, one more thing is that uh, we, we've, uh, we've made a bunch of enhancements at the pad and the way we connect our commodity lines to the pad where we can leave most of them connected when we go from vertical to horizontal and back again. Uh, the only thing we have to reattach is the liquid oxygen loading line. And so we'll be doing that tomorrow morning and verifying that that's leak tight. That's the one thing we have to, to reconnect. But uh, so that's some of the improvements we've made uh, to enable this 24-hour uh, late load, uh, final cargo load, right? Okay. And to your second question, Ken, so uh, typically when Cygnus flies, uh, we use the thrusters on the, on the spacecraft to control both the attitude and orientation of the spacecraft. And that, that fuel usage eventually causes us to run out of fuel, and that's typically the life limiting um, commodity. What we're doing on this mission is we're, we're installing something called the control moment gyro, which uh, uh, CMGs is the, the acronym for that. And that is a piece of equipment that uh, actually will do the orientation and attitude control of the vehicle for it. We don't have to use the thrusters for that. So we save all that fuel and we can apply that saved fuel to just orbit maintenance and keeping the vehicle uh, at, the, at the proper altitude. And that's really what allows us to fly this extended duration. So part of that experiment, it's, it's, it's multifold. One, we want to demonstrate our ability to fly G CMGs uh, in an alternate attitude control system for Cygnus, which we can implement on future, future missions. And second, we want to demonstrate the avionics capability of, of running for long periods of time uh, in orbit. And of course, we've been able to run, that, uh, uh, run those avionics for several months, uh, three plus months on previous missions. This will go uh, an extended period of time, even you know, double that or so. Uh, third, we want to um, uh, really demonstrate the, the, microgravi the really pristine microgravity environment that Cygnus will provide to whoever would like to use it in the future, either to host scientific payloads, uh, to host technology demonstrations, uh, sensors, or, the, or, or new technologies for, for uh, deep space missions. Uh, and we also might have the ability in the future of flying away from the ISS with experiments loaded from the ISS and then eventually go back to the ISS and deliver those, those experiments. And then as I mentioned uh, in my remarks, to do that we know that if we're going to fly a mission for a long period of time, let's say a year, it's very likely that there'll be a cargo mission during that time frame. So the other thing we'll demonstrate uh, once the NG-12 mission is launched is that we can fly two Cygnus vehicles in orbit at the same time uh, with using our mission control center both in Dulles and in Houston. So it really has, has a lot of, uh, really a dense experiment that we're, in demonstration that we're, that we're performing. All along that time, we have asked our team to come forward with ideas of other experiments they'd like to do on the vehicle, which is something we typically do after we leave the ISS, just to test out the vehicle, other capabilities, and so I'm sure over the months that we'll be in orbit, some of those ideas will come forward and we'll, uh, we'll put those into play. Okay, so that's all engineering. Yeah. Uh, so, so during this demonstration, we won't have any scientific experiments on board. That's it. We're, we're doing the demonstration on this mission to prove that for future missions, we will be able to carry those scientific experiments. Great. Uh, thank you. We will now go to a few social media questions, and then we have a question on the phone bridge after that. Chelsea? So I have a question from Twitter. What is the most challenging part of this mission, in your opinion? To anybody? <laughs> well, let me do that one. Um, we've got the, the NG-11 mission here launching tomorrow. We also, Station has a SpaceX-17 CRS mission launching in about eight days after that. So we will have two cargo vehicles, two science-heavy vehicles berthed to the station at the same time. It's good that we've got four crew, but there's so much science going on that we have a couple of weeks coming ahead of us where we can't even do all the science that's in the plan, let alone all the other normal stuff that's in the plan. Thank you. And now we have a question from Facebook, unless you wanted to add anything. Okay. Uh, so when we're talking about 
the Antares rocket and you say we are a go for launch, are those conditions different than saying we are a go for launch for a mission with a crew on board? Well, uh, that's a, I guess that's a good question. Uh, you know, I think, uh, you know, I, th I guess they're speaking of uh, a rocket that is rated for, for to carry humans. Uh, my understanding is I'm no expert, uh, having only worked on uh, expendable launch vehicles carrying cargo and satellites um, to orbit. My understanding is there needs to be a, a higher level of redundancy at, on the avionics, navigation, and the actuation system uh, needs to be redundant as well. So I think those are the main features that need to be at a higher level of reliability than we currently specify for our vehicle. Uh, you know, we try to strike a balance between um, all those things and cost, and so, uh, you know, that results in the vehicle we have, which we, which we are very confident in, but I think it would be another increment uh, to be carrying humans on board the rocket. There's different constraints, different requirements. You have to have the abort modes. Um, what happens if you have a, you know, a problem during ascent, so you want to have the abort mode. So it's just a, it's a different vehicle versus crew, ver crew versus cargo. Thank you all. Uh, we have a question on the phone. Jeff Faust. Hi, this is uh, Jeff Faust with Space News. Uh, a couple quick questions. For Frank, do you have a uh, targeted duration for this extended Cygnus mission once it departs? It sounds like several months, but I didn't hear a specific number. Uh, and then for Joel, how did the schedule work out so that you had uh, two cargo missions flying effectively back to back to the space station? Was that deliberate or just the way the, the overall station schedule worked out? Thanks. So I think to the first question, one of the, uh, one of the main goals of this demonstration is to have two Cygnus vehicles in orbit at the same time. So as, as a minimum, we'd like, assuming we're successful, we'd like to have uh, NG-11 on orbit when NG-12 launches and we operate that vehicle. So assuming that's in the fall time frame, we're thinking something on the order of six to seven months as a, as a minimum mission duration. Once we achieve that goal, if we've achieved all the other goals, then we'll, we'll regroup and determine when, how much longer we might want to fly the vehicle. So, you know, minimum six or seven months and possibly a little bit longer. Let's see, as far as planning, you know, do we plan missions a week apart? Uh, generally, we don't do that. Uh, <laughs> Our plan is to fly when, when the customers are ready. And so what we look at is the manifest of when people think they'll be ready to fly. We look at the vehicles that are available at that time, and then we schedule accordingly. Great. Thank you. Uh, we have another question in the room. Thank you. Sean Costello, Space Flight Insider. A question for Frank. Can you expand, please, on the naming of uh, this Cygnus, the importance of and the history that you're bringing forward into everyone's mind? Well, as we went through the process of, of selecting the name for this mission, we, we recognize it's the 50th anniversary of the, uh, the moon landing on, on Apollo. Uh, and as we talked through that, what we, we kind of gravitated to was looking at thinking about the folks who have sacrificed so much to make that, to make that happen. And uh, we, we zeroed in pretty quickly that it's really the folks that made the ultimate sacrifice that we wanted to, we wanted to focus on. And uh, that, that turned out to be uh, Gus Grissom and Ed White and, and Roger Chaffee. Uh, and then when we, when we talked about who amongst those three we would, we would choose, we selected Lieutenant Commander Chaffee because of the fact that he just hadn't, hadn't made it to space yet, whereas as Gus Grissom and Ed White had. And so we thought bringing him into space with Cygnus as his namesake was something that we could do. Um, it was about as special as we could come up with. So that's really the, the way it came about. Thank you. Great. Next question. Hi, my name is Taylor Michael from Goddard Space Flight Center. Um, one number I've heard repeated a lot over the last decade or so has been that for every dollar that you put into NASA, you get about $10 back. I think you were talking earlier about the return on investment and how it's questioned. Um, can you speak to that more? Because I think that, I think that generally outside of this room, most people aren't really um, paying attention and those who are don't know very much. So it'd be really nice to hear some other uh, responses on the return on investment and how, how, I mean, how it really benefits us. But even, even in a simple, you know, a dollar gets us $6 back kind of way, something simple like that. Thanks. I'll I can try. It. So Good. as far as dollar numbers, I, I can't give any dollar numbers, but we can probably get that, you know, afterwards. What I will tell you is we're, we are doing things on board the International Space Station that benefits people here on Earth. You know, one of the things 
that, uh, that I like to talk about a lot is the, the Canadian arm we have on orbit. And so the technology that is used on the Canadian arm um, is used today in order to operate on brain tumors that in previous times could not be operated on. And so where I see the return of investment is you see there's hundreds of examples of that. The, the fuel I talked about, the fuel burning efficiencies, if we can have bigger satellites that can be more operational because of things we do on orbit on the International Space Station, that's a direct benefit to people here on Earth. Uh, the Canadian experiment, um, again, studying what happens to the mind on orbit and how the mind reacts to microgravity. You can apply that to diseases here on Earth and what you learn on space. And, and so there's countless examples of that. And to me, that's really the benefit of the International Space Station. And we're going to keep going. We have uh, lots to do in the future, and we're going to keep bringing those benefits back to Earth. Pete, did you have something to add? Sure. Uh the Benefits for Humanity document and the attempt we made to try to quantify some of these things, we call them case studies because each case is unique. Each case, um, as you go through it, is arguable about what assumptions you think are actually direct commercial benefits. So that was part of the challenge, uh, and I would encourage you to go to that website, slash station benefits. We have an executive summary, which does explain some of the, the attempt at economic valuation. We got to start somewhere. so. And I would say when you invest in space, you get access to the universe. Next question. Yeah, in reference to the data that you mentioned with the twins, um, mm -hmm. is there any uh, further plans to continue that study? And if so, how would that translate to a benefit to patients or to medicine here on Earth? We don't have any twin astronauts in the pipeline, <laughs> so that, that's an unfortunate thing. Uh, related to that, though, our human research program wants to continue the one-year mission studies, the longer duration studies. So a lot of the things we learned through concocting this twin study and the whole one-year mission program will help us there in the future. Um, it'll be a great thing when we get the commercial vehicles flying and we know what our, our crew rotations are going to be, then we can start adjusting who's flying when and coming back when. But yes, all this that we're learning, um, how to make the best use of the technology to analyze the samples and the genetic variations and stuff, that is all going to feed back as well into benefits for people, just healthcare here on the ground. It, it, gets, it opens up the door in one sense of now that we know the genetics for an astronaut who's going to fly and maybe what they're susceptible to, can we tailor some of the, the care and the responses to what they're going through to the individual genomic makeup? And a couple more social media questions. I have one from Twitter. So how late can late loading be on Cygnus? How much time is needed to bring it back up vertical on the launch pad ahead of the launch? Let's see, I think our plan is we'll, we'll start the process at 24 hours be, before launch, and that process will take several hours before we hand the vehicle back over to Antares to put, finish putting the pop top back on the fairing and then uh, transition the vertical and, and, and get ready for launch. Uh, I think as we go through the process in the future multiple times, I think we'll, we'll see how those timelines go. But I think it also is probably some, uh, a function in, in some cases of what that late load cargo is and, and how it needs to be handled. So uh, right now the focus is uh, demonstrate as we, we did over the last summer with, with a, a demonstration and now and for real that we can start at L minus 24, get that cargo loaded and, and launch on time. And as we go through missions of doing that, um, we may be able to see some other efficiencies. So. And then real fast, we have another one from Twitter. How long will Cygnus be staying with the ISS this time? I think we're planned to be there the full three months yeah. now, right? So yeah. right now we're looking at a, a late July on birth date. Late July on birthday, yeah. So about three months, yeah. Okay. Uh, I think we have another question in the room here. Thank you. Alex Mankiewicz of the Zog 43 newsletter. Now, this is for Kurt. Uh, should there be a scrub very late in the countdown? Uh, and after it's safe to approach the rocket, would you automatically uh, bring up the mobile uh, clean room and configure our Antares into the late load mode, or perhaps there are other considerations? Yeah, good question. Uh, so if we have to scrub the, the launch for, for uh, a reason such as weather or, or a boat incursion or something, uh, we have the ability to stay vertical. We would just stay vertical and try again the next day. 
Uh, but a lot of that is dependent on the specific uh, cargo that NASA has loaded on board Cygnus. And so we've been in consultations with them and discussing what our plan would be in that, in that case. And so for this mission, uh, my understanding is we would, we have the ability to just uh, delay one day, stay vertical, and try again the next day. Uh, we also have the ability to go down horizontal, but that would be a two-day turnaround uh, for this vehicle. Um, starting with uh, NG-12, we'll have more of a capability to go down, refresh, and then launch the next day. Uh, but we don't have that uh, for, this, for this mission. So that's something we'll be practicing and refining. Uh, but if we don't go tomorrow, then we would try for the next day. Okay, uh, thank you for all your great questions and the great answers. Uh, thank you for joining us here today for our pre-launch news briefing. A reminder that launch is tomorrow at 4.46 p.m. Eastern time. That's the launch of the Northrop Grumman Antares rocket with the Cygnus spacecraft headed to the International Space Station. NASA television coverage will begin at 4 p.m. Eastern time tomorrow. Until then, you can keep up to date online uh, at nasa.gov slash Northrop Grumman, and you can always follow Life and Science Aboard the Space Station at nasa.gov slash station. So go Antares, go Cygnus, and go science. <laughs>